I'm sure each of you must have gone into this with feelings of trepidation too, Simon. Oh, yeah. I mean, terror. Terror, <laughs> terror. which, um, well, I mean, exhilaration and terror, really. I mean, obviously, there's an element of it which um, said, <laughs> you're in a hiding to nothing, sunshine, really, by <laughs> doing it. On the other hand, why would you not want to do it? Mm. And I think the sort of sense of actually, um, uh, you know... A, appreciating, as I did, I mean, more than appreciating, really loving what Kenneth Clark did, mm. came from the coherence of what he was doing, um, his very almost instantaneous swerve away from anxiety about are the walls caving in on civilization to producing what really had been the great narrative since Burkhardt, possibly even since Kant, mm. really, that we are saved by the kind of sunlit narrative of um, the arrival of reason in the Renaissance and so on. So it was really, it was really, even though he ends on a kind of rather dark, weirdly kind of slightly sour note, um, there was there was a sense that this was a kind of driven, clear, um, optimistic, humanized story. Yeah. And um, uh, so to take that on, um, seemed, I suppose, both foolhardy and really important that, that um, and it was the fact, I think, actually, that it wouldn't be just one of us, that it would be three of us, that then immediately broke the surface of that. And the dangers of that, obviously, are the possibility of a kind of intellectual chaos and so on, but the great kind of possibility was of raising questions without losing the plot, without compromising people's enjoyment of the masterpieces. But actually, you feel that you know all the great writers about art, from Hazlitt to Lawrence Gowing or something, you know, were were question askers, and some of the artists, as we saw, you know, um, in the last few minutes, also raised questions. So that that was the rock face challenge: can we actually do this and pose those questions without being party poopers? And I don't know. I think we had a <laughs> yeah, go at it, really. I I don't think we were party poopers. Not at all. Um, no, no, I don't, I, no. I don't think. Because, Mary, well, you must have felt the mantle of, of Clark looming God. over you at times. It, well, yeah, well, I, I remember watching him. I, I mean, I, I'm in age between Simon and David. Um, and so I was 14 when I watched mm. Clark. And it was utterly eye-opening. I remember it being, um, you know, uh, I, I hadn't... You know, I didn't watch it on the colour telly. We were all supposed to. We had a Radio Rentals black and white yeah. set. Um, <laughs> Took some of the fun out it, of it. <laughs> but still, it, it was eye-opening. And I mean, I now remember 1969 in so far. Um, this is partly self mythologizing but you know, the, the first part of 1969 was my eye being opened by Clark on civilizations. Then a couple of months later, it, you know, men went to the moon and the telly cameras mm. went there, mm. and there was a kind of sense that somehow television was taking you where you could not go. Gosh. Mm. And, uh, and in many ways, I think I, re I remember Clark more vividly than I remember the moon landing. Um, <laughs> that's I, a sign of who you are there. I think uh, that's had fair enough. Of, <laughs> but, but also, I mean, you know, as you're kind of suggesting by saying, look, we're looking at this with our students still. And, you know, I've, so you have a terribly love-hate relationship with mm. with this original series, mm. and because it it changed my life in all kinds of ways. I, he and he didn't just show me things that I hadn't ever seen before. He showed me that you could construct a historical story mm. out of visual images, among others. Now. Clark's story is one that I don't want to tell much any longer. Right. Um, so, and, you know, I've spent a, a, a good bit of my teaching career um, being slightly, or more than slightly, critical of. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. But on the other hand, A, my memory of it, as for me, you know, as a kid in Shrewsbury, age 14, suddenly seeing, you know, that there was a world outside this country. Um, but also going back to it and discovering that all my candid nasty uh, jibes at it that I'd made <laughs> in the intervening decades when it seemed not very sexy to um, to like Clark. Yeah. You know, we were all supposed to like John Berger, way of seeing. <laughs> That's what we were supposed to do if we were trending. And I went back to Clark and mm. I went back to the Berger and I thought, bloody hell, it was good. Yeah. Mm. You know, yeah. it was actually 
good. Really yeah, content. I would heavy. still like to mm. argue with that old man mm. you know, mm. every day. And I'd yeah. tell him, you know, I want you to be not so posh. Yep. You know, I don't want you to <laughs> please, you know, take off those bros. Get rid of the auto cue. He did yeah. it all from an auto cue, right? He didn't. He wasn't just naturally fluent and us naturally stumbly. <laughs> he did it from an auto cue. <laughs> but all the same, it was damn good. Well, I, 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 I'm so glad you've said all those things. I feel exactly the same, that it is something you, I, I absolutely adore, but also had its, its downsides, its, it, its things that needed to be changed. I'm sure you felt too, David, it, it needed to be addressed. There were things about the original series that we could not possibly do nowadays, could we? Well, the more I think about it, the more I realise that Clark made a series for uh, the late 1960s, mm. where the big issue was survival, was... It, is this party over? Um, <laughs> we've made a series, I think almost accidentally, about the big issue of our time, which is about our incredible interconnectedness and globalness, and yeah. whether mm. the complexities, the challenges, the dangers of that. So as much as I've sort of written in newspapers, Clark was a product of his times, I think we've entirely proved accidentally <laughs> that we are exactly the same. But yeah. to be involved in this was to be involved in TV history. Yeah. I mean, this is... I mean, this is a series presented by Kenneth Clark, commissioned by David Attenborough. Yeah. Um, as, as Simon said, um, when I was asked to be involved, the, we need, what a stupid question. Who wouldn't? It's like, you know, who wouldn't join the Beatles? I mean, it's, 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 an, it's an incredible, incredible thing yeah. to be involved in, 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 in any capacity. But the sort of the weight of that history, um, you know, we've, we've all carried it around for three years. Yeah. Uh, could, could I just slightly object to the idea that in 1969 we were all thinking the party was over. <laughs> I mean, Clark, Mary was having I mean, Clark, Clark was thinking the party was over. Yeah. And I was thinking the party was just, just beginning. beginning. Clark was worrying <laughs> about people like Simon yeah. who were in Paris. Well, I, I was actually, I was. Um, I was being lightly tear gassed in Montparnasse <laughs> as he was doing that piece to camera um, in front of Notre Dame. So, which, which is, is a, a wonderful party, symmetry. Yeah, yeah <laughs> it had its points. So. But, you know, he didn't, you know, 1969, and there's hardly a woman in it. Yeah. You know, he yeah. didn't, you know, actually in 1969, he didn't have to. To be so blinkered, mm. you know. So the, I, mean, I think it's a wonderful set of programmes, but it, there were, were other things going on in 1969. As Simon contested. Well, with, I, th I think it's. That, I that think he it's was not part of the yeah. actual. Without, um, uh, th there is a kind of, um, there is a natural climax to that series. I think actually in the. Um, in the 18th century programmes, really, mm. um, where everything seems to come together. Um, uh, Voltairean reason, Mozart and Be Mozart not yet Beethoven. Um, the, the kind of spirituality of the Rococo, one of the great sequences is that, the sequences in Bavarian Rococo churches. Um, and then suddenly, actually, uh, you know, uh, storm clouds loom in the shape of the French Revolution. And, and Clark gives, because he actually wrote very well about romanticism in the Gothic Revival books, a great book, not uh, often enough read. He understands the emotive, visceral power of all that, but he, he, he sees it ultimately as kind of sinister yeah. and difficult and disruptive. And there is a kind of, there is a kind of shadow over the ebullience of his presentation, yeah. actually as in the in the last two programs and he ends you know so memorably with saying well with the collapse of marxist socialism and then we forget actually that he and berger were very good friends and the marxists and the patrician you know were naturally mar intellectual marriage made in heaven and berger was going down to salt the castle all the time so he says so he says in a complicated way and his friends were you know coldstream and others of the herbert reed of the left and he says, well, uh, now that socialism has ended, all that's left, it seems, is heroic materialism, the, mm. the title of the last program. Mm. And I suppose we, it, we have to be optimistic, you know, Voltaire, Houdon, Smile of Reason. But I can't say that the prospect fills, um, leaves me or fills me with much joy. And that is the end of the series, yeah. actually. Yeah. And I think one of the things that, that, we've tr that, that has come upon us, actually, in the... In the in, uh, in great series, I think there was a great deal of kind of rethinking on your feet and, and, and rather fine happenstance that I certainly have encountered. Uh, to take up David's point, they, we, we kind of came sideways to the sense in which actually the cultural connection or the disconnection of cultures, and it's not always an issue of conflict and blundering misunderstandings, mm -hmm. is at the heart of what we do today. And in some senses, what is most 
worth celebrating and rejoicing is the attention which those cultures pay to each other mm. and which, you know, we've, we've actually narrated, I think, through a number of... Well, well you have, very, very much, and that was one of the things that struck me. There were, there were two major differences that, st- that sort of jump out at you as soon as you see what you've done and what Clark's, Clark did. First off, it's not civilization; it's civilizations. Uh, with that nice S that floats in in the pre-title sequence. And also multiple voices. Not one narrative, but three. And I i mean, I would say that's hugely significant. That was deliberate, David. So tell a bit more about that. Well, I think, as, as I said, I mean, Clark made a series for the late 60s um, in all sorts of ways. It's in everything we do, even if there wasn't a great landmark 60s series to... to to live up to, we, we tend to just naturally look more globally. We tend to see these connections more readily, more obviously mm. than, than we do. And I often think that the presumption is that this is done dutifully and it, a sense of worthiness. They're just better stories. Mm. And mm. I don't th- see how you would make sense of Europe's story without seeing its, 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 its globalism. I mean, I'm so moved to see... Rembrandt's. I was uh, touched by that too. You know, yeah. I mean, his his even sense. It reminded me of Dürer's response to yeah. seeing the art of the of the Aztecs yeah. as close as it's possible for us to see alien art yeah. from an uh, extraterrestrial people, a people of a continent he did not know exist as a young man. Mm. This yeah. this playfulness, this joy, this interaction. Now that's not always the case, and some of this is violent and horrible. Yeah. But it's art is at least it's a witness. An artist are in a very special place when these sort of encounters happen. Mary, you're going to pop. <laughs> Go on. <laughs> I, I, of course I agree with all that. Yeah. You know, I mean, of course I agree with all that. Um, and, and making this series and has uh, shown me things that I'd not looked at before uh, that has opened my eyes in all kinds of ways. And I, I, I have n- no doubt about it. I, uh, there are nevertheless, I think, interesting, difficult undercurrents, which are, I think in the end we managed fine, mm. about putting an S on the end of civilization. Mm. Mm. You know, that it, first, Clark, by restricting himself to Europe, Western Europe, really, could tell a narrative story. Mm. You, know, you, you can tell a story of Western European culture. Mm. It, there might be we might disagree about the nature of the story, but there's a chronology. Now, as soon as you start to do, you say, it's the world, and one thing you lose, and I think for better or worse, and often for better, is the idea that there's a chronology. Yeah. You know, yeah. you can't do a story which says, and now, meanwhile, in New Zealand, yes. you know, yeah. dot, dot, dot. You know, there is, there is no linear narrative. And I think that helps the story yeah. because it pushes you to argument. I also, I, when we first started filming, and I, I think I found intellectual and emotional ways around this, I did kind of think, look, of course I think this has got to be civilizations. Of course I reject what you could do 50 years ago in terms of a deeply Eurocentric view. Mm. But somehow just waving a magic wand and saying, now we're doing the world, guys, and you have in my case, not in the other cases, you know, 63-year-old lady, white lady, going round, claiming that she can talk about the civilizations of the world, uh, is almost as totalizing and ethnocentric, in some ways, as actually talking only about Europe. Mm -hmm. Now, in the end, over the years in which we're making that, I began to find that there were ground firm ground on which to step in which you could talk about us and them and barbarity and civilizations mm. without just saying, look, guys, I know it all. Yeah. And I, I found that at the very beginning when I was starting to think how I could say, right, you know, here we are in India, here we are in Mexico, and here's, you know, elderly old Beard telling you about it because she knows. Well, yeah. actually, she doesn't know. Well, this is it, and, and it's something that I, I think about consciously in the work I do, and I'm sure it crossed your mind regularly in all the different locations you were in, at what point our specialisms 
allow us to look outside and make reasonable statements on things that we know less about. Um, what interests me about the three voices, the multiple voices in this series, is all of you obviously have different ways of looking, but you also have different disciplinary backgrounds because you know, David, you're a historian, Mary, you're a classicist, Simon, you're an art historian. In what respect do those disciplinary approaches affect how you uh, approach this series? Well, I, it's questions at me. Uh, you know, I don't, I, I don't, didn't think um, right now. You know, um, I have a historian's hat as well. I'm, yes. I'm now going to actually, you know, be for this series pure art historian. But it's it's true. I've met at Columbia over the last nearly thirty years. I've taught overwhelmingly in art history, not in history. But I, I would just say that it's it's sort of built into. Um, built into my kind of intellectual wiring, and has been for a long time, to feel that at the same time that actually art doesn't come ex nihilo, it's self-evidently, and it's a kind of commonplace to see, that art, works of art come into the world through demands of patrons and societies and buyers and how they're going to be seen and so on. Nonetheless, there are certain moments actually when works of art are their own independent agents and none of the data you could possibly produce from 17th century Holland would have given you the night watch. Mm. All that data would have given you Bartholomeus von der Helst's version of a militia mm. painting, would have given you... Um, uh, you know, uh, Hovet Flinks, they wouldn't have given you the Night Watch. Mm. So something actually, um, and this is kind of rather, I know it's sort of unfashionably <laughs> mysterious and metaphysical of me, I'm totally unrepentant <laughs> about that. Sometimes I think actually great works of art change the rules of the game completely and they construct culture as much as they're constructed by them. Mm. And I felt that over and over again. I felt it at the point where Matisse discovers he makes the cutouts. Mm. I discovered, particularly, and I wouldn't agree altogether with Mary about total loss of, of chronology. <laughs> the biggest surprise of the evening. Um, but total <laughs> loss of chronology, because I think we, we, none of us pretend to say, oh, we, you know, we can kind of swan in and discourse, as the word has it, about African art. Of course not, of course not. But what, what we've all tried to do, I certainly um, have tried to do, are the moments where sort of slightly magically, different pieces fall into the place, mm. addressing each other. Mm. Um, for instance, um, in, the, in the end of the programme, a bit of which you saw about colour called Radiance, um, there, are, there are two metropolitan worlds which have become suddenly metropolitan. European metropolises like Paris and the biggest city in the world, Tokyo, Edo, then called Edo. Edo suddenly, again, from nowhere, produces something not like classical Japanese art at all, woodblock prints which you buy for the price of two bowls of noodles. Mm -hmm. And rather extraordinarily and almost fortuitously, those become available very quickly from the 1860s onwards, uh, also um, at relatively low prices, mm -hmm. to people who are trying to find um, beautifully, I have to say, narrated in David's film number eight, Definitely. trying to find what metropolitan yeah. art could be. And across, across an enormous distance, there is a, an acknowledged honeymoon mm. between these two art cultures. And that struck me as a real <coughs> moment, mm. kind of logically. I, I mean, in all kinds of ways, I agree with you, and I think we kind of we share a humility about what yeah, about what you can, uh, about what you can orate about, um, even you know from a particular platform and a particular set of knowledge. I think that I'm less convinced about the magical moments mm. than Simon is, and I, I mean, in fact, in, in terms of my own specialism, I mean, I'm. What I work on is actually one of those magical moments, mm. which mm. was referred to mm. uh, in the clip that you saw and was discussed earlier in that film, which is Great. when the Greek Revolution happened around 500 BC, and when actually there was a sh a, an extraordinary shift um, to really a style of representing the human body that Western culture has never overthrown. Mm. You know, mm. That goes back, and, mm. you know, and part of the reason I wanted to do this was that I wanted to show, look, you know, ancient art really matters here, guys, um, mm. that there are issues 
and styles and ways of thinking about the human body that we in some ways inherit from two and a half thousand years ago and we haven't got rid of, thank heavens in a way. But when I then say, and I start to look really at, so why did that happen? Why did that magic moment happen? Why do we have sixth century figures which are all plank-like and stiff and I think rather wonderful and then Mm. The sculptures start to be the sort of naturalistic sculptures. You know, in some ways, it was quite nice to go on screen and say, we just don't mm. know. Yeah. You know, yeah. there isn't a, an artistic genius here. There isn't a great man. Mm. It isn't to do with democracy, much as President Bush used to think it was when he kind of uh, displayed his version of the Greek Revolution in New York. Uh, the chronology doesn't fit. Uh, there is something here about social change and nobody has ever been able to explain it. And I think that's that's the the in the conflict that comes out of all the differing voices, but actually becomes quite a, an exciting point of difference because, you know, I agree on the one hand, you know, there are fine works of art that do seem to defy the, their environment and then the, in, the huge environmental pressures that are experienced put upon artists and the creation of art. David, in your films, you talk about both of those. You talk about you know, the fact that war can create very dark and depressing art, but that also these points of, of the East meets West can create beauty as well. So you sort of sit in between the two viewpoints, don't you? Well, probably, but I'm, I'm interested. A lot of the art that I'm looking at, we don't know who the author was. So yeah. even if there was those, those great moments, as there may have been the, the, the craftsman, of 16th century Benin are anonymous. We know the subjects, the kings, the patrons, we don't know the artists. But uh, what I was trying to, what I wanted to talk about was the predicament that artists are put in, in those two very exciting moments, what Europeans call the age of discovery, and in the second program, the 19th century, the age of progress, the industrial revolution. Uh, and to, to meet artists who find themselves with viewpoints, with predicaments, in positions that a generation earlier that they didn't face, and to show how things that we might have missed are encoded within that art. I'm interested in the idea that the art of the Dutch Golden Age that Simon's written about very eloquently, as, as, as many historians have said, it's also of the Dutch globalism. Right. The art, the art that of, uh, of, of uh, Tokugawa Japan and of Meiji Japan is also about a moment of interaction and globalization. Mm -hmm. That these things that we see as quintessentially Dutch or quintessentially Japanese are actually interconnected. And that that's in some ways one of the, some of the most wonderful mm. expressions and moments come out of, of those predicaments. Cultural collision, exactly. I, we have to open up to the audience. The time has raced by. I'm, I'm sure you're very, very, very quick. Yes. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sit back, everybody. It. It's carrying on. Oh, just very, um, <laughs> the, uh, the first museum in the whole world, as far as I can tell, which actually does, does not divide its galleries mm. into Spanish, Dutch, Islamic mm. art, and so on, is the, the, the um, Abu Dhabi Louvre. Actually, mm, um, Abu Dhabi, yes, yes, which has actually tried to do a simultaneous. So I, That's we weren't particularly programmatic like that, but we, mm. uh, it, 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 it's it's a um, a difference to uh, it, it's it's a different way of doing things, mm. um, which I think we're it's working, very happy about. Yeah. Mary, uh, all I want to say is that, that I hope, well, I think we've all done this actually in all our films, even if I'm going to voice it more explicitly, is to say that look this. The stuff that we've seen that we think is beautiful, whatever, it's been fought about, it's been argued about, it's been contested for centuries and centuries, and it's been ignored. I mean, I think that one of the things that really drove me to do this was that I have sat filming for hours and hours and hours with nothing to do in museums with the most amazing classical sculpture, yeah. and I have watched even museum goers yeah walk yeah. past yeah. the damn things yep. and you know i want to say look you know a well i want to say two things i say this is really interesting mm -hmm. you know this was really shocking you think you see any old nude oh god another bloody nude venus this is tracy emin guys you know well this is a Damien lot, Hurst. Lot better. Yeah. Lot better. But, uh -oh. <laughs> mary but imagine no, being an anglo-saxonist everyone yeah. walks past my stuff all the time <laughs> also can i just say it's okay not to like some of exactly. it exactly you know actually i don't really like el greco sorry <laughs> Oh, yeah. oh, oh, 
I can see why. When he's Spanish, we have to like it. I can see why. We have to make up for it. I can see why it's interesting. Don't cause another Spanish incident for the second series. We don't all have to like the same stuff. It's okay to say, don't much like that. Exactly. I'm going to say, uh, I'm going to preempt this, and the BBC, um, the corporate BBC, will be worried now. Um, there, uh, there is no Leonardo. Yes, yeah. yeah. there is no there Leonardo. Is no Leonardo. <laughs> uh, my response to that is, it just shows you how bloody good the rest of world art is. Yeah. That we can make <laughs> nine programs on world civilizations, and Leonardo is. Actually, oh doesn't quite make it. I did want actually the Leonardo <laughs> moment, which would not have helped actually in my precarious position about Leonardo. Actually, I this is going to no, I'm not even going to say this. I have mixed feelings about not Leonardo's mind, but Leonardo's paintings. Ah. I have deeply mixed feelings about them. Um, but I actually there was a wonderful story where um, there was a demand in the Ottoman Empire um, for a bridge over the um, Golden Horn. And Leonardo actually um, spontaneously produces an extraordinary visionary drawing of a huge bridge beneath which um, the tallest galleon could sail with ease. And then somebody goes up, I think it's Bayezid, uh, Sultan Bayezid, and said, well, that Leonardo, he's, he's obviously very clever and very good, but they tell us in Italy he never finishes anything. Yeah. Which is true. <laughs> so they say, you want to phone up the other bloke? So they actually asked Michelangelo, who said, not interested. Yeah. You know, so it was kind of wonderful. That Damien like, Hurst. That Damien Hurst. Yeah, yeah, so David, what would you have liked more of? Well, I still can't believe that Courbet is not in the 19th century oh, film because he was yeah. in about 50 iterations <laughs> and and he seemed the sort of safest horse in the race oh, no. and somehow managed managed to fall out. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm gutted by that. But in some ways, you're making programs, you're trying to fit complicated stories in to tell a bigger narrative mm, and good. things that you really care about, you in have to... Pe people in television call it horribly infanticide, oh, that you have to... Uh, okay bump off things you care about. So there's lots of things that I personally am very passionate but about that aren't in the films that I've made. Yeah, but that's yeah. where the argument comes in. You know, if, if you can't simply tell a linear chronology of world art, yeah. you have to yeah. do what John called a series of essays, there are a series of arguments, and actually that helps you select what you're going to do because yeah. every work of art in these yeah. programmes is singing for its supper. I didn't fully understand how how much Vermeer's paintings can be read as um, as a statement about not just those very, very seemingly, seemingly domestic insular mm -hmm. scenes. When you deconstruct them, they speak in a way that I didn't understand. In Connections, the, the thing I was most, the artist I was most pleased that we managed to talk about in my films um, was Gottfried Lindauer, who there's a lot of artists, you, there's, a huge cast of characters you could use if you want to talk about how artists are placed in the predicament of their relationship to colonialism. How do you record the colonization, the domina domination of other peoples? In Lindau, we have an artist whose skills are co-opted by the people on the other side of the frontier, and he becomes uh, their servant, and they become his patrons. Um, I, he was not somebody I was aware of. He came out of conversations with the team and the consultants, and I'm now slightly in love with him. Yeah. So um, that, that was a great connection for me. Well, um, what a really interesting question. It is a great question. Um, I, I, I think actually all of us who you know, have made a lot of television films actually have um, always the issue of um, having to be two different kinds of personalities at the same time. That's to say you want to be a friend um, to you know, you want to be invitational to the viewers who may not otherwise you know be interested in the subject you're talking about, but you don't want to be so matey that you turn into one of those monsters in a pub who have to tell you everything about the cup final of 1953. Um, on the other hand, you need to be an authority too. So the two poles you're working between is the trust of the audience in your authority, uh, which at the same time is made more invitationally friendly, so it doesn't feel like, like homework. So actually, with Clark at the back of you, <laughs> you have the most extreme form of that dilemma. Because I think actually his, what he did naturally without ever calculating it was 
you know, the, the famous patrician charm. Absolutely. It was absolutely the sense in which how would you not be interested in Les Très Richeurs, in Giotto, and so on. So um, that was difficult. But of course, if you self-consciously have that on location, you are utterly screwed. So you kind of internalize that. But there were moments, I don't think, um, what, yeah, uh, Ashley Gethin, one of the directors who's not here this evening, with whom I made the Triumph of the Art program, there were moments where we did um, have a look at the monitor of what we just done and said, did we frame that, right? You know, was that actually the way we framed it uh, visually? worthy of what Clark and Michael Gill and Peter Martignon did. We would say that a lot of the time. Were we asking questions, even if they aren't the same questions as Kenneth Clark, in the way which absolutely doesn't ever patronize the audience? And as far as the edit goes, I'm a total control freak. I'm in the edit. I'm a terrible person. I'm in the edit all the time. I do all the color grading. If you all hate the color grading, it's my <laughs> fault. Not for Marion um, and not, um, not, not David. Yeah. No, but for my own programs, I do the color grading. I'm so I'm neurotically so do you, you know who to address about. your letters to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, very good. But it is an excellent question, Mary. What do you think? I mean, I I was uh, one of the things I've enjoyed about this series from the two episodes I've done is that I was in the edit much more than I've ever been. Mm. And that was actually, for me, really interesting. I mean, I, I, you know, I, I did feel that this was a collaborative project with the director and other members of the team from start to finish, and mm. that was great. And I have a, a kind of... Well, I, I, I have a different sort of stylistic repertoire from, from Simon or, and David, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's partly because of what I do. And... In, in terms of subject matter. And I, th I think that, you know, I work in, in a subject, classical, largely classical art, which is, which is kind of shrouded in reverence. Mm. You know, and it's shrouded in so much reverence, people don't get their brains in gear to think about it. They just know that they should admire it. Mm. And uh, while we were absolutely convinced, and I hope you've seen, that this material should look as absolutely damn brilliant as it could ever be made to look with a television camera. Mm -hmm. Now, I want to say, look, come in here. The, the, the issues that I'm talking about, they're not rocket science. Mm. You don't have to know all that much. I can tell you what you need to know. And then you can engage with this material without, be so, without being so kind of cowed and overawed by it. You know, yeah. Classical sculpture comes with this idea that we should revere it even when it's not very good, mm. right? So, you know, so your tone was one of being kind of yeah. friendly and approachable, but but still, like Simon yeah. says, authoritative. And, and but also provocative. I yeah. mean, you know, you saw me saying, you know, this was rape, right, yeah. of yeah. the Aphrodite. Well, you know, that's intended to get people to think, is it? Mm. You know, actually, is it? You know, can a statue give consent? Well, of course it can't. <laughs> you know, so this in some ways is a very stupid provocation, mm. but it's also an appropriate provocation to think about that, that borderline between female flesh and sculpture. And... You know, I, I want people not to turn off these programmes and go off to bed and mm. say, wasn't that lovely? Mm. That, that Professor Sharma. Let's have a Such thing. a sweetie. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, you know, oh, that I want them to have a damn <laughs> argument about yeah, what's been that, going on. Right? I, I think that's come through. <laughs> uh, David, you must have, uh, again, you had to choose your own tone <laughs> for how you presented. It's tricky, isn't it? I mean, it's, it is difficult to know the right balance between authority, it, friendly. It is, and, yeah. and, uh, and you know, Simon said, having the ghost of Kenneth Clark on your back yeah. for three years doesn't enormously help that's probably a good discipline and I'm going to miss him slightly but um, <laughs> it's easier if you're a woman <laughs> yes. yeah you don't but feel I, he's we, quite we were speaking about this earlier I mean to me it TV doesn't work unless you care yeah and if there had been yeah. uh, an artist mm. a mm. movement right. a moment in history that I could yeah, not right. engage with yeah. that's when I would have resisted yes. yeah. and said no and I, I you know it's always a compromise it's always a discussion but if I thought, I just can't engage with this and I'm going to come across mm. as someone who's narrating rather than engaging, mm. then right. I would have said no. That is a very, very often, yeah. and you know this, Nina, very often the location or the object 
takes over. Yeah. Well, partly one of the things uh, that we're very lucky about is that, although you have to get up very early <laughs> or stay up very late, m very often if you're working in museums and galleries, you, it has to be before it's open to the public or it has to be in the evening, but you're alone oh, the with this, the, the crew, but you kind of actually do just, after years and years of this, kind of yeah. blank out the crew. And you do have this extraordinary connection. Co connection, and which at the same time, when you're in the presence, you you have an overwhelming sense of what a prat I am actually <laughs> wording on about something which is untranslatable into words. And at the I same time, you feel an intense. Ah. You do. Okay, well, I do. I do. I was saying early on, you know, about the oh. ninth time I've talked, tried to talk, and I hope sensibly about, about the Night Watch. Yeah. I felt, and Rembrandt is in the Night Watch, you may or may not know this, in the presence of a single line about row, a bit like Hitchcock. And I just felt that eye saying, oh, not you again. Mm. You know, oh, so no. good. But look, so what we do, you know, what we do is words, you know, and mm. I yeah. think that is what we, that's what we're offering to people. We're yeah. offering to people yeah. uh, a, a, a response, sometimes really well informed, sometimes not. But it's a response that I think is absolutely every time changed by being there.